I think over the last 12 months or so, or at least uh, since November of last year, uh, since ChatGPT came on, uh, I'm sure all of you are either thinking or have fielded questions about what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my career, uh, how many more years do I have until I retire, uh, do I want to go through this revolution, right? So obviously this makes us think as leaders, as, as, as an employee of any organization, right? So it makes us think, you know, how we go about this, what kind of answers do we give to our, our employees? So that actually made me think. And so what I did a little bit was went back in history. So let me take you back to January 1812, uh, a cold sort of uh, winter night, uh, somewhere in the outskirts of Nottingham, England. Uh, there's a person called William Ball. He had a, he had a textile manufacturing unit. Uh, one night, suddenly, four people uh, just brought their sledgehammers with their handkerchiefs you know, over their faces and just broke in and just destroyed about five uh, textile units. And that actually started or kicked off uh, the resistance against the Industrial Revolution. So, and, and henceforth, you know, you can read on, there were a lot many more uh, sort of activities or protests that happened uh, to, to protest against the industrial or rising uh, era of machines, right? So, so that, to me, I think, you know, uh, I can kind of resonate back with what some of us are going through right now. It's just that you don't have, uh, you have the sledgehammer, but you don't have the machines. Right? Uh, so I think we are in a little bit of a soup there. Let me take you back now to July 2023. So let me just read through this to just give you a sense of what's going on. So a son asks his father, Dad, can you review my acceptance speech in school? Father says, reads the document and says, dude, the writing is too perfect. It doesn't sound like you have written this. Have you copied this speech from the internet? Son says, no, Dad. I asked Chad GBD to write me a few samples. Father says, that's even worse. You didn't even make an effort to search and copy from a few samples. Right? Son, really upset, says, what is wrong with making bots work for us? Isn't this why we created them? Right? So I took the result that came out of ChatGPT and tweaked it to my style. Oh, by the way, I also asked ChatGPT to give me decimal math problems for practice before my math test. That's my son and this is me, right? So the father. So totally spellbound and that truly made me think where we are headed, right? So you either hop onto this bandwagon or and accept that change is coming, accept that we are going to coexist, accept that we are going to be living with machines, accept that we have to become better than machines to exist or coexist. So that is, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's, that's the topic that I want to talk about today, coexisting with generative AI. So let me give you a glimpse of what we are looking at Gen AI uh, from a reinsurance or a insurance industry perspective. Uh, clearly, the use cases, primary use cases, they're very simple use cases. Anyone in banking, finance, uh, insurance can easily uh, resonate with this. So we're looking at customer engagement. Uh, that's huge, right? So you're looking at uh, extremely smart chat interfaces, uh, you know, you're not looking at, uh, you know, the gone are the chat bots, but you really want the chat engines to deliver and respond and complete a use case while the, while the client is out there. Uh, that is really huge from, from an insurance perspective. Insurance services, you know, we're looking from an end-to-end -end sort of right from uh, an underwriting to issuance of a policy or be it a banking use case where a customer walks in and walks out 
Uh, so we're looking at integration of all these services. So you're looking for Gen AI to help you on that front. Unstructured data, or, or data in general, the processing of structured and unstructured data, uh, this is not something new. Uh, this has been around for about 10, 15 years where people have been dealing with piles of information, piles of data, they're trying to make sense of it. Uh, there are regulations today, banking, insurance, they all go through regulations and, uh, and you just can't get away from paper. You just can't get away from paper, you just can't get away from Excel spreadsheets. That's just the nature of the business. So the only way you're going to get around it is by automating these processes. Uh, we have been on that journey for about 10 years or so and what we have seen is that we've been very successful with large volumes of data that are very simple to process, right? So you've used the traditional machine learning algorithms, you've used you know, uh, context-based data extractions, machine learning, et cetera. But where we actually have been struggling is places where it could be smaller volumes but extremely complex or unstructured data. The industry has been really, really struggling on that front. So that's where the LLMs are really helping in expediting the entire processing of the data. Same with images and sensor data. You know, and in the insurance world, we do a lot of image processing. Uh, you know, you're looking at you know post you know NatCat. You're looking at you know post you know NatCat when you know when calamity occurs. You want to assess what the damage is, what the impact is to the customer, and you want to translate that to a monetary. Uh, aspect as far as claims processing is concerned. For that, you know, you need really powerful, really powerful engines, you know, which can actually go through the entire process. So that's clearly where Gen AI is able to help us. Again, that's because of the large, you know, language models that we have. Uh, workforce augmentation clearly uh, is, is something I think it's, it's, you can't get away without talking about it. Uh, you know, as far as content generation is concerned, you know, that's going to affect every employee and in a effect in a in a positive way where it's going to improve enhance the productivity and ensure that we can go about doing our works on a day to day business so imagine you have a company of over 15000 people and would would it be nice if all 15000 or at least 80% of the people are focused on something to do with insurance reinsurance or the core of the business rather than focusing on the non core activities uh, again, you know, use cases around summarization where we spend, you know, a lot of time trying to summarize or try to make sense of volumes of data, volumes of pages. And those summarizations are really important because we underwrite based on that. We issue a policy based on the documentation and based on the context that you provide. The large LLMs are really successful on that front. Uh, code generation and review from a tech community perspective, uh, things we do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, probably about, again, an 80-20% rule. 20% uh, is where, you know, things are quite complex. 80% is, again, the routine run-of-the-mill. You know, that's where uh, the uh, Gen AI use cases are really helping out. Now, as far as Swiss Re is concerned, uh, so from a key focus for the company is concerned, again, you know, out of the use cases, uh, what we have really looked at is over the last... Again, you know, uh, AI in general or machine learning in general is not a new topic in the industry and also as far as Swiss Re is concerned. Uh, we've been on this for many, many years, at least two decades now. And, and clearly, you know, we have data worth 160 years worth of data. So we know the importance of data and we know how to risk mitigate based on the data we have. Uh, but what we have done is I think we're taking a very conservative approach as far as implementation of Gen AI is concerned. And we're doing that to ensure we do not lose track of our clients, our customers, our partners, and we're not putting them at harm's way, right? Uh, so what we have done is we've looked through the entire reinsurance chain or the insurance chain. We have picked 50 use cases. And most of these use cases are around the use cases that we just talked about, processing of unstructured data and workforce augmentation. So clearly from a processing of unstructured data perspective, the use cases are around handling of un underwriting submissions. So when, when you know, a policy request comes in, you have tons and tons of Excel, complex Excel spreadsheets, which have data all over the place, and no Excel looks 
the same, uh, those are fed into these, these algorithms and we try to extract data more accurately than what machine learning based models did. Uh, same way goes with contracts. You know, believe it or not, some of the contracts that we, that we sign, uh, the policies behind them are for 50, 100 million dollars. Those contracts are pretty important, extremely important. And to understand each and every word, understand each and every line makes a big difference. So we have, we have put in quite a bit of time trying to apply these use cases where we can compare contracts from last year to this year to see you know, what the changes have occurred. That's one of the places where we're looking at investment reports. Investment reports are huge. You know, we work with, you know, we are especially a B2B company. You know, we work with insurance carriers. We essentially insure the other insurance carriers. So, uh, you know, understanding their investment reports, understanding their exposures, understanding, you know, where the client's risks are, are extremely important. Uh, these are some places where, you know, where we typically are using or are in the journey of using it. Now, machine learning, obviously we started with machine learning models, et cetera, to, to go after these use cases, but we did not find much success. Uh, that's clearly, as I stated before, we had uh, complex data, the processes were, uh, you know, a lot more sort of raw in terms of, you know, the, the, the human touch is concerned. And so it was more important now that now with more advanced LLM models, you know, we're seeing a lot of, you know, benefits coming out of it. Uh, workforce augmentation, clearly, you know, having use of uh, tailored AI assistance, augmenting each and every, or rather supplementing each and every employee, uh, we believe that that is going to help productivity, increase productivity, be it a tech community or it could just be a simple, you know, underwriter or it could be a risk manager, you know, we think there are a significant number of use cases where we can help them become more productive. On the right here, I just wanted to discuss, you know, the four kinds of, uh, four kinds of uh, Gen AI engagements or touch points that one can have as a company, as a large enterprise. Uh, clearly on the top left corner, you see the consumer tools. Uh, that is your chat GBT, right, which is available out there. Uh, you and I can pick it up and use it. Uh, clearly, there are risks with that, as you know. Uh, you, you don't know what the models are. Uh, you, you don't know what data it's looking at. So clearly, the risk is extremely high. Uh, obviously, you know, that is not something that, you know, that we encourage. And those are, these are some of the types that are totally banned inside the organization, and rightfully so. We want to protect the client information. We want to protect our customers, you know, uh, risk, post risk exposures, et cetera. Uh, again, on the, on the left uh, bottom corner is the fine-tuned model. So again, that's an extreme other end. Uh, if you take an example of Bloomberg GBT, uh, where uh, very extremely advanced companies have created their own uh, you know, Gen AI models and sort of interfaces, but they, uh, the, those models are very, very much uh, geared towards the organization, geared towards, you know, one specific need. I think we are not there yet as far as, you know, the Bloomberg uh, GPT is concerned. Uh, we would obviously want to get there, but uh, again, that is not something that we want to take in because models like that will essentially come with a lot of history, come with a lot of sort of biases, and those are not something that we want to sort of, you know, start our journey on. Uh, the, the models on the right, which have the green tick marks, I think those are the models that uh, we are going forward with. And we typically see is that uh, most of the use cases that we would have as a company, uh, we would be able to solve them with these, these two setups. Uh, clearly embedded in applications, I think, you know, that's an example of Microsoft uh, Copilot or the Office Copilot as you know it. So that's clearly, you know, available to, uh, to it, it, it is available to be embedded in our landscape so that we can uh, enhance productivity, et cetera. Uh, the one other thing that I want to point out is, you know, we also try to differentiate between uh, static and dynamic uh, models, right? Uh, static models, again, you know, do not sort of learn by from the prompts that we provide, dynamic models, you know, can learn and sort of can sort of uh, become more mature and become more smarter 
again, as an organization, we want to stay away from the dynamic models for now. Uh, or rather, if you want the dynamic models to be there, you want the models to learn from your data. So clearly, I think you know, what we're going after is restrict the data that is supplied as prompts to the models. Second is, as much as possible, use static models where you can control what goes in into the model as a prompt. And what comes out, you want to ensure there is a human element in there, a human in the loop ensuring that they actually can inspect what is coming out. And these are the ways, these are the, the, the sort of guardrails that we have put out there to ensure that we give the confidence back to our clients to ensure that your data is safe. Do not worry, because I, I'm sure if anybody out here from an insurance or banking industry knows that a specific bank does not want their data to be provided or even be accessible to another bank. That is a total no-no, right? And same goes with the insurance industry as well. They do not want the data to be moving around. So we have to be very careful in terms of how we create those silos, but at the same time, we learn from them and you know, become, more, uh, become more productive. So uh, now, clearly, as we, as we do this, uh, there is obviously you know, a lot of risks involved in the Gen AI uh, field. So again, these terminologies out there that I'm going to throw out there are not new. Uh, these are all, uh, you know, anybody out here who has been reading about these models have been experiencing. These are clearly the, uh, the, 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 the terms or terminologies you want to uh, stay away from or, or make sure that uh, you address these issues if they happen. So clearly hallucinations, right? Uh, in terms of hallucinations, biases, outputs that are not true. Uh, obviously, you know, what, what we have done is we have calibrated our models uh, again, taking a very conservative approach to balance predictability and creativity, right? So you don't want the models to be totally open, unguarded, so that they totally become very creative, and that kind of you know, allows a little bit more scope for the hallucinations to come. So again, taking a step back, trying to ensure that uh, the models are much more controlled uh, within sort of a box. Uh, making sure we provide for reliable or consume reliable data sources, an extremely, extremely important step. Obviously, there are two aspects of data sources. One is our own data that we have uh, within the company. So obviously, those are the data points that we are going to be serving into the models. But at the same time, you know, at, you can't get away from using external data for reference data, et cetera. Now, you want to ensure that you're taking data from reliable data sources. Uh, again, you want to ensure that prompts are built while the reliable data sources are fed in so that there is a check and balance in terms of what you're feeding in. Hello. And as the output side, you want to ensure that there is a human Hello. ensuring that they're doing the checks and balances and ensuring that, you know, that you're, not, uh, you're, not, you're sort of filtering for hallucinations. Uh, as far as malicious use is concerned, you know, clearly uh, what we want to do is any use case that you take, we want to review the use cases. We want to ensure that the use case does not, or rather we want to measure the risk that the use case will have uh, to our client base, to our customer base, et cetera. You want to ensure the use case does not pose a risk in, as far as the output is concerned to, to either the reputation of the company or your clients are concerned. And at any point in time, what we have also built is we have built in a lot of audit trail uh, to ensure uh, around prompts, to ensure you know, what goes in. We have clear audit trail around or clear logs around you know what is going in and also what is coming out of the models uh, data protection confidentiality is huge for us uh, probably the most important from uh, from all these four uh, again as i mentioned before we are not looking at dynamic models we want to ensure we use static models in our in our gen ai programs and ensure that you know the models are not learning from the prompts uh, we isolate the copies of the models. We ensure the models are not interacting with each other. Uh, I think because once the models start interacting with each other, the output from one can kind of you know, influence the input or the prompt of the other models. Uh, and again, forbid the use of public tools. So uh, you know, we, at any point of the life cycle, you don't want any interactions with the chat, GBT, et cetera. Uh, Intellectual property and data sovereignty, I think, you know, a uh, session before the lunch, we were looking at a, hearing a speech from a gentleman on, uh, on media, from Z, I think, uh, 
this, this is a huge topic, uh, IP sort of violation, uh, data sovereignty, et cetera, or breach, right, data breach. Uh, obviously, we are going to, you know, uh, we are going to, you know, uh, uh, face that. So I think at some point, probably when we get really mature, uh, we will definitely have to tackle this situation uh, and have to figure out, you know, how uh, we, we uh, protect ourselves from that. Uh, but for now, what we have done is we uh, ensure that our models do not uh, recreate or sort of imitate third-party content. Uh, so we are being very careful, watching very careful, uh, being in the insurance industry where you are operating in more than 150 countries, you have to keep a tab of all the legislations, you know, all the data rules, you know, where some, so you have to keep track of all the rules and regulations that, you know, each and every sort of region is coming up with. So that's one way to do it. Uh, so, so when, so when you look at, or, you know, when, as, as you spend a few days here and uh, you're going about hearing, you know, things on Gen AI, how we are implementing or other peers are implementing, I think a question really, you know, uh, at least comes on to my mind is, uh, at what pace are we sort of proceeding, right? Uh, where would we be 2025? Where would you be 2030? Uh, I think uh, if, if I had to sort of think through or answer that question, uh, I would say, you know, uh, you would probably see companies like us, large enterprises like us, will probably take a very conservative approach ensure that we set the guardrails first, ensure that we do not put other customers or our sort of employees at risk, and then sort of play within the chalked out playground. That takes time, and that probably, you know, as you can see, you know, the number of guardrails that we have put at each and every place, it, it sort of becomes a little bit more uh, cumbersome, right? But that is for the right thing to do versus on the other side of the spectrum, if you see startups or if you see data companies, et cetera, where they are in the business of selling, you know, the end product, uh, for them probably, they will probably be moving at a much faster pace. Uh, clearly the LLMs are going to evolve uh, significantly uh, as far as the efficiency is concerned and also the maturity is concerned. Before I uh, give my thoughts on, uh, you know, my foresight on how Gen AI would evolve, I just want to give an example of, uh, of one sort of a use case that I happened to witness uh, about six, seven weeks ago in one of the large sort of uh, consulting firms where I was shown a demo of, uh, of how uh, AI, or sort of how uh, AI can actually help build an insurance system, right? So you're looking, you're talking about a policy system, you're talking about a pass, you're talking about uh, claims management, billing, life cycle, et cetera. Now, people in the insurance uh, world, you know, if you know the, if you know the likes of ProSight, et cetera, you know, those are some, or, or Insurity, those are some platforms that actually do that for a living. They charge significant amount of money to actually provide the license. Now, you will not believe this, but I stood there providing inputs or prompts as a user to the system in exactly 22 minutes, a fully functional insurance system with an AI, with a user interface was created with all documentation as far as design is concerned, test cases, traceability to requirements, the requirements, documents, et cetera, was created in 22 minutes, right? So now, if, you, if I go back in my time about 15 years or so, that would have probably taken a team of about 20 people, about eight, nine months or 12 months to do that, right? Now, clearly, I was blown away by that. Now, obviously, that system is not going to help a large company like, you know, like Swiss Re or immediately, right? But what that actually gives us, it gives us a starting point. It gives you a starting point on and, and the way the prompts are designed is at each and every stage of, like while you're finishing requirements or design, humans, which is us, have the ability to tweak the requirement 
at that point in time. So I always think of the Gen AI as a 80-20 kind of a thing, right? Where let the models build the 80 for you, and then you take that over, take the result over, and use the 20% to tweak it. Use the 20% to sort of customize it or make it complex. So that's just one example. So I think change is imminent. Anyone who is resisting it, you really need to think about it. It is not going to replace us, but rather, as I give you the example of 1812, I think it's going to force us to become more specialized, right? In the example of building a system, if, if, it, if it took an insurance system about five architects to build it, in future, my prediction, you're probably going to need one super techie architect to review the design output that has come out of a Gen AI model, and they're just going to validate it, tweak it, make it customized, ensure you know, the, the guardrails for the company that they work for you know, is going to be provided, and there you go. It's done. Right? So I think that's, that's where the industry is sort of headed. And I think you know, as, as people, as humans, right, we, we should embark on the journey of trying to become really good at what you do today. And, and think, of, think of AI or think of sort of gen AI models as, as somebody who gets you to that 80% mark. Uh, clearly, you know, there's going to be a lot of focus on improving work efficiency. And obviously, you know, predictable tasks will cease to exist, right? I think that is very, very clear. We have been seeing that for the last 10 years, but now I think we have a license, we have a model, we have an assistant sitting at your desks, on your desk. You don't have to now have a data extraction program. Like if you want a data ingestion program to be run, you have, let's say you are an underwriter, you have about 500 uh, spreadsheets coming in. You had to call up your tech division and tell them, can you spin up a program for me to ingest uh, all these patches? You don't have to do that. You're going to have, with your Microsoft you know, license, you're going to have that already at your desk. So repetitive tasks, predictable tasks will cease to exist. And with that, I would like to take any questions if you have any. Yes, please. Hello. Thank you for the wonderful session, and I really love the perspectives. Uh, I have one very unique kind of a thought process, right? If we have somebody who has done a PhD, and we give him a problem of a high school to solve, right? Is it justified? It is not justified, right? So somewhere, what I feel is like everybody talk is talking about uh, AI as a prescriptive modeling solution. We have a typical data set, and we are always gaining insights of existing solutions, existing approaches, whereas we are lacking on the predictive analytics. That is one area I feel it needs a little bit of creativity from incumbents. So what is your thoughts around it? Because you are from insurance, and insurance can reach uh, up to last mile if it can be innovated. Yeah. So please, thank you. No, I think, I think you're touching upon, you know, when you told predictive analytics or predictive AI, uh, I think you're talking about the, the different forms of AI that we have, right? The struggle out here with Gen AI, if you really look at it, it is actually building the content for you. And that is where our, you know, our sort of antennas really go up, right? So what we as companies, as far as the insurance company is concerned, uh, let, let me give you an example. Uh, today, you know, as an underwriter, you, know, you, look, you look at the different risks, you look at you know, who's asking for a policy, et cetera, and you come up with a policy, right? So now that is the inputs parameters, and we, the content is kind of in your mind, and you come up with a policy, right? Now, if I were to augment the underwriter and use a Gen AI model to spin up you know, policies, now, to me, that is doable. That is definitely doable, but I definitely want a human prompt to be put out there. So what we really want is, I think in future what's going to happen is we're going to have those policies to be issued or policies to be issued for review, right? So going back to your example about PhDs versus you know, high schools, right? Uh, 
the PhDs, I don't think, you know, the, the, the specialization that you have is going to get augmented. I think that's the difference that everybody out here is on the stage is trying to drive, is that you, you need the PhDs to review or to, to sort of put the specialization flavor on the content that comes out. So I hope I answered your question. Next. So unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions. Okay. We will have to take this offline, if you sure. don't mind. No, not a problem. Thank you again, and uh, thanks for your time.